Good evening. This is Dimitri Lascaris coming to you from Kalamata, Greece on September 10th, 2024. During the past week, I've been on a much needed vacation. And although it was a brief vacation, a lot happened during my time off, especially in West Asia, which uh, seems to be par for the course nowadays. Events move so swiftly. And one potentially key development was that on Monday, September 9th, Likud Nisim Vaturi, a member of the Israeli Knesset's Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, claim that it is a, quote, matter of days, close quote, before full-on war erupts between Israel and Hezbollah. To discuss these and other key developments, Radhi Francis has kindly joined me again today. She's a war correspondent based in Lebanon. She has been to conflict zones throughout West Asia, including Syria, Gaza, Yemen, Iraq, and South Lebanon. Radhi has a large following on X, amongst other platforms, on next, she goes by the handle Gad, at Gadi Francis. Thank you so much, Gadi, for joining me today. Thank you, Dimitri, for uh, for being involved and for coming to my country a few weeks ago and for reporting the way that you did. And I really appreciate uh, the opportunity you gave me to discover North uh, Lebanon, which was entirely new to me. It was uh, a, a memorable experience, uh, to put it mildly. You're most welcome. So... Gadi, Nisim Vaturi has been spewing genocidal rhetoric again. Uh, in the past, he faced heavy criticism for mul multiple comments calling uh, for the, quote, burning of Gaza. And in January of this year, he asserted that there are no innocent Palestinians left in the Strip. In other words, he evidently regards the million or so children living there as culpable, even the babies. Now, Vaturi says that Beirut's Dahia suburb, a major Hezbollah stronghold, will look like Gaza. Those were his words. And according to Vaturi, there is no other way. He claims that Netanyahu is of the same opinion and th that this is something that will develop in the coming days. Now, on your side of the border, on the resistance side, what do you make of all of this? Do you see indications that Israel is preparing for a large-scale war? Do you think that this is more chest thumping? How do you read these uh, extraordinarily aggressive comments? Well, the first uh, thought that came to my mind as you were reading, Dimitri, was like, tell me something I don't know or tell me something new. When did the Likud party not be genocidal towards us? When did the Israelis say something not genocidal? I mean, we're talking about uh, people who openly say that, the, that they, are, they are entitled to attack the UNRWA uh, they say the UN is Hamas. They say the hospitals and the schools and the refugee uh, uh, camps, they are all Hamas and they bomb everyone and they have impunity and they have vetoes protecting them and they have mainstream media whitewashing their crimes. You could see the, uh, the CNN says people were killed. The American uh, Turkish activist was killed mysteriously. We don't know by whom. This is the headline when it's uh, Israel committing the crime, whereas a fake story of 40 beheaded babies still is the rhetoric in the mainstream media, and people still use it to justify beheading hundreds of babies in Palestine. I mean, we're past that. We're past that. Today, as uh, I was, I mean, you know how I kind of struggled mentally to come and talk to you. It was a mental struggle. We all have, regardless of the idea that I drove all day and I, I'm overworked, I couldn't I'm talk sorry, because I'm sorry I'm... to have had that effect on you, Kathy, but I really, I really. No, it's, I'm struggling mentally because it's not, it's not you. It's like, it's like, I was like, I cannot pull myself together to be uh, gentle anymore. We are traumatized people today. Dimitri, I, I, I'm like, I'm going to be there out there like I am. Even if I cry, even if I get, I mean, today, my day started by seeing three nine meter holes in the sand, in Gaza, and Khan Yunus. And in the midday, I saw Nabatiyya being attacked, and I wondered for the first hour if it's someone I know. Mm -hmm. uh, this is how we're living. And then you come and you say, and say the Israelis want a full-blown war with Hezbollah. When wasn't it war? Mm -hmm. When wasn't it war? When weren't we killed? When weren't we dehumanized? When did the war stop? What would the war look like? You kill civilians, you kill people, you bomb shelters. What is If this is not war, what is war? And do you think all that blood, all that blood is useless? If it's useless for the mainstream media and if it's useless for the Western uh, complicit governments, it's not useless for us. These are our people being massacred. 
it's not different to when you hear today in the in the news you hear or like when you're reading history you see 28 million russians died fighting the nazis oh my god that was so precious it made up russia we are in our hundreds of thousands being massacred we are more numerous than what happened in the world war ii and one the the mass and the brutality has exceeded every human possible uh, uh, imagination at that point. I don't care what the Likud person says. I don't want to know their name. I don't care if they are threatening with war. They are savages protected by the world and they they have mil- billion dollar funded army and they're still losing for one reason, for the simple reason as something very, very basic like the movie Avatar. And for the same reason as something very, very complex, like why people win or why uh, South uh, uh, Africa is not uh, an apartheid state anymore. It's because the truth always prevails. The indigenous people cannot be erased. Here, uh, albeit here in Palestine, they will not be erased. All the amount of blood and the resistance. The only reason, the only reason I, I, I pulled myself together to talk to you, Dimitri, in the end of my struggle, of my collapsing and my crying and my like anxiety and all kinds of issues that PTSD people suffer from. Uh, the only good thing that happened was that I, minutes ago I just read the breaking news that there's a there's a an, a, a military airport airport that's probably being used to bomb these tents that was attacked by my Lebanese brothers. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay. I'm alive again. I can talk to Dimitri from Kalamata. <laughs> <laughs> so this was, as I understand it, Gadi, the first attack or reported attack in the current round of hostilities by the Islamic resistance on this air base. Is that correct? I suppose so, yes. But it, and, it's not about if it's the first one or the last one. It's just about the the ability to deter, the ability to say no. The ability to say, you cannot do whatever you want. Had there been the ability to attack us, the same brutality they are doing to Gaza from day one, Dimitri, they would have done it. But they can't. Mm -hmm. Because this doesn't go without retaliation. Because there is, and I don't think, you know, you've been to the South. I've been to the South. We have have experienced Hezbollah as analysts and like... uh, front row uh, uh, viewers for the past decade. I have seen them in Syria. I have seen them in Iraq. I have seen them in wherever they have been. And I've seen them in 2006. Hezbollah now is is an army. It's an army. Mm -hmm. It's not a militia. You can tell yourself it's a militia or an Iranian proxy, but to name things as they are, they are very well organized, very much capable. And this tells me that the only reason why they are not attacking all the airports is not because they can't. It's because of the politics. It's because of the war diplomacy that's happening behind the doors and in the corridors. It's because of the multiple uh, uh, roles that each part of this axis of the resistance is playing on many fronts. The orchestration, the harmony that is happening between What's happening in Iran, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, inside Palestine, even Yemen? These things, and also in the in the in the messages and the messengers and the mediators that are coming and going. So I think Hezbollah, if the Israelis start a war, Hezbollah can do wonders, wonders. Because in two thousand and six, nobody. I don't think, and I'm not trying to bluff here, and I'm not trying to spread propaganda. It might be inside the politics of Lebanon, something petrifying for me in the future. But right now, this is a fact. No one, there is absolutely no one that has defeated Hezbollah on the ground. Mm-hmm. I'm talking when, when it's like army to army, not an aircraft. Right. They couldn't take any meter of land in Lebanon. They couldn't. And they were able to help the Syrian government deter ISIS. And they were able to help the Iraqi government deter ISIS. And they were, they have, some of them, their leaders have fought uh, in Bosnia or they are very skilled, experienced ideological group of people in their tens of thousands that this is their land, their mountains. They have lived here for decades. They have fought here. Most of them have martyrs in their families. They cannot be stopped. And for me, nothing changes to what the Israelis say. Mm -hmm. It's more about what's happening on the ground. You know, 
Gadi, before we began today, I did my uh, daily check of the uh, resistance statements. I've been checking them on almost a uh, daily basis since this genocide began. Uh, because you can't get uh, their account from any Western media source. You have to go directly to uh, the resistance. And I consult various channels on Telegram to see what they're saying. And today, uh, yesterday, they issued the standard uh, report summary of military operations. Uh, by my estimate, they conduct anywhere from 10 to 12 military operations on average every day. They are striking multiple military bases, oftentimes targeting barracks, Sometimes they target uh, spy equipment. Uh, sometimes they target tanks. Uh, they oftentimes provide video footage to back up uh, the claims that they're making. I myself witnessed uh, an attack by Hezbollah on uh, the Matula base a couple of months ago. And uh, oftentimes the, the Israeli media, uh, despite the censorship constraints, confirms a number of these attacks, although they give relatively little detail about the extent of the damage. And uh, I... I'm absolutely amazed, I have to say amazed, that after 11 months of bombardment, relentless daily bombardment of Israeli military targets by Hezbollah, the Israelis, despite all of this bluster and this Vatuti character spewing more genocidal rhetoric, have yet to launch a significant ground incursion into South Lebanon. Um, but at the same time, it seems to me that if they don't try to deal decisively with uh, the Islamic resistance in this round of conflict, the image, the mythical image of Israel, the indestructible military will have been exploded. Uh, and the deterrence, the terror, the, the, this, this deterrence of terror that they have exercised over the region for decades will be uh, utterly eviscerated. And Israel this will- This has already happened, Dimitri. They are not invincible. They are tainted all over the world. Everybody knows who they are now. Everyone can see what they're doing. Nobody can lie anymore. I think the their image has already been broken. Right. But do you think that inevitably they will feel it necessary to engage in a massive escalation, for example, by bombarding Dahia? Or do you think this is something that may, may realistically be avoided? If we look at what's happening on the ground, the day that they killed the civilians, they killed the the rescue the rescuers in their double attack in the south, which is like which was Saturday, last Saturday. They, they, they killed four emergency workers who were putting out a fire. I understand, right? Is that what you're yes. referring? to? Yes, that's right. Sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Um, the next day they were like, and the and uh, the wait. The way that the Israelis are dealing with southern Lebanon or with Hezbollah is very new and very fearful in a way, regardless of what analysts say. I don't think it's an uh, it's it's uh, it doesn't mean that the war will stop. I don't think the war will stop. I don't think that the Israelis can stop the war at that point. I don't really totally disagree with the theory that you have just proposed, but I don't think they can do more. You know, and if they do, we will see wonders. I think what's stopping Hezbollah from escalating the war is um, many reasons, but one of the main reasons is the internal Lebanese politics, and it's the they don't want to make more problems internally in Lebanon because there's a a big lobby in Lebanon that says we don't want this war, we don't care about the Palestinians, and it's a way in ruling and governing Lebanon, and Lebanon is already collapsing. It's a sectarian uh, uh, country. And I think this is one of the main reasons for the uh, pace of how Hezbollah is reacting to that war. And also another reason is that the Israelis, till date, uh, they did not open that. Uh, that uh, They're still attacking uh, in the south in a way. They're still trying to do assassinations. And then when the retaliation happens, they try to play down. They're not as... Uh, at all, they're not doing what they're doing in Gaza, not because they are uh, uh, civilized, not because they have any regard to humanity, not because they are not intruders or invaders, it's just because they simply can't. And in this war, in this long-term war, I, I uh, in your, in your uh, introduction, I wrote here, what is war, when you were talking? I mean, what is war? Do you think the war started on October 7, to me or to my father? or to my uh, uh, sons uh, or daughters, if I have any. No, the war started when they took our land, Dimitri, and it will only end when they get out of our houses. Mm -hmm. It's never going to end. 
whether it's uh, it's uh, like the the frequency is high or low the oscillations are, are are like big or small this war started when they took our land they are doing it every day they are confiscating land every day they are illegal settlements every day they are dehumanizing us every day they are persecuting raping occupying every day and this is an ongoing war for us. It doesn't matter if it's being reported the way it should be, if it's being regarded the way it should be on the ground. This is how we're living. This is our reality. This is what's happening in Palestine and in Lebanon. There's no, there's no uh, end to that until justice prevails. It never ends in life. You can hide it, you can paint it, you can uh, put it under the carpet for a while, you can have a certain nuclear talks maybe that would like play it down, something new in the United States that could tame Netanyahu, maybe the Americans overthrow Netanyahu, the Israelis change something in the politics, some kind of an, of an orchestrated end to that cycle can happen, but the war will not end until the land is liberated. Mm -hmm. There is so much blood right now. Have you ever heard of a people that has put millions of martyrs and just changed their mind and said, well, it wasn't worth it? Mm -hmm. Six, 76 years have passed. Today, the people are closer. They are not like, you cannot really think like, okay, the Palestinians will forget about it. How can they forget about it when the last leader that was killed in Jenin, uh, Abu Shuja, or in, sorry, in another camp uh, in West Bank, Abu Shuja is a 26-year-old man. I mean, they they used to have George Habash and Wadi Habba had that. Today they have these young fighters mm -hmm. that have a different, maybe sometimes have a different ideology, but they are doing just the same in their their own way. So Palestine did not end. The Palestinian resistance did not, did not end. The Palestinians did not change their mind. As for Lebanon, the Lebanese not only liberated their land since the 90s and the 80s. and the 80s, we kicked them out of Beirut. Khaled Alwan, an AUB student, American University of Beirut student, okay, came, killed three uh, Israelis having coffee, Israeli uh, soldiers having coffee after killing people in Hamra. He killed them and he fled. And the Israelis since then started uh, getting out of Beirut. They stayed in the, in the southern Lebanon and then the people in the south remained in their fight, remained in the resistance until in the 90s, never stopping. 90s, 98, 2000, they liberated their land in 2000. There were no occupation anymore. The occupiers went back. You know, they were inside Litani. They were inside South Lebanon, the places where you went, Dimitri. They used to rule it. They used, they used to have uh, an army for them. And they were kicked out in 2000. And then in 2006, <laughs> we did Lebanon initiated. Lebanon, Imad Mughni, initiated an attack. Why? because he wanted a prisoner swap. And there was a 33-day war, and they couldn't do anything. And the prisoner swap happened. Mm -hmm. You are talking to people who were able to get things, to deliver things to their people. Mm -hmm. We are not talking about a cause that lost. In the time frame, in 2006, the Lebanese people, the Lebanese resistance, Imad Mughni, attacked with his... With his uh, Hezbollah fighters, they attacked a tank on the borders. And this borders, which we don't even like recognize as, as Lebanon, they took the 33-day war to make them concede. They didn't. They won. Samir Untar, the Lebanese prisoner in the Israeli um, prisons was freed we saw him as people we saw him freed that was a man that we never thought would be out of the jail dimitri we never we never me as a kid i never thought we would win over israel but we did mm -hmm. i never thought samir Kuntar would live outside the jail he went out he got married he has a kid and then he was martyred by israel in damascus so i'm just telling you bits and pieces of stories of how these people will never go back a lot has been put and a lot of development in their fight has happened. So even if you're like sitting on a, on a mountain, you're not involved, you're not a Lebanese person, you don't really care and you're watching a movie, do you think they're going to give up? Mm -hmm. so, so, Gadi, they're never going to give up. You mentioned, uh, and I'm glad you did because I wanted to ask you about this, the, the sectarian nature of Lebanese politics. Um, now, uh, we those of us who have even a passing familiarity with the history of the country know that 
Le Lebanon has suffered terribly from sectarianism uh, for many years. Um, but in the four times that I've been to Lebanon in the last 11 months, the only protest that I saw, the only civil discord that I actually witnessed with my own eyes uh, was first of all, a massive and quite hostile protest at the US embassy in October of last year, uh, which uh, Hassan Nasrallah de de designated as the day of rage. Uh, and there I saw Lebanese army soldiers uh, put down uh, with uh, significant force or try to control with significant force a very large and angry protest. And then I, of course, uh, witnessed several protests against the genocide. I have not witnessed, uh, I'm sure they've occurred. I have no doubt I've seen reports of it uh, over the years, mass protests in Lebanon against the government or against particular political factions. Um, but within the last several months, just based upon what I've seen, uh, there has been a uh, although there's contingent ser certainly exists that you mentioned that you know wants to stay out of the war in Palestine, uh, there seems to be a, a certain level of stability and a certain level of social cohesion in Lebanon. Whereas in occupied Palestine, we are seeing a descent into chaos, and I'm referring specifically to the mass protests which took place uh, days after. Uh, six of the hostages were uh, killed uh, in Gaza in late August. And it, there, almost, there almost seems to have been a role reversal where Israel is uh, now beset with violent sectarianism. It's becoming increasingly violent. We saw, for example, these right-wing lunatics go to, uh, they, they tried to ransack an Israeli military base because they wanted to liberate soldiers who had been detained after video emerged of them raping a detainee. Um, so do you sense, uh, again, I understand the limits on, you know, sort of what you can say about what's happening in occupied Palestine because you're not there at the moment, but it seems like there's a higher degree of social cohesion and national unity in Lebanon at the moment than there is in Israel, which is quite remarkable. Uh, is that your well, sense? Well, we are a nation. There are people from all around the world gathered under very radical ideas made up by Zionism. We are a nation. This is our ancestors' land. We are all one, regardless of our differences, regardless of our differences, even of our, our civil war. We are one. We look like one. We eat like one. We act like one. We are the same people with with, with a lot of baggage and, uh, and uh, civil unrest, yes. But we are all Lebanese. Whereas there, they are Polish, Russian, American, uh, Moroccan. They are not the same people. Do we really buy that lie? They are people, they are Indians, they are Brazilians, they are not one people. <laughs> they are gathered by hatred only. <laughs> this is to start with. But it's not about really the protest only, like we have a lot of differences in our community in Lebanon. We have a lot of people who have always sided with Zionism, whether uh, knowingly or uh, unknowingly because of their uh, because of their fears and their sectarianism. But in general, um, the way we shape our politics is not the same because we have financial crises. We have an attack from like a hegemony. We we have been even our our maps have been shaped by the colonial powers that came and invaded our region. We're still not liberated. So the way we shape our struggles is not really of a very uh, uh, stable society still. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you when you talk about these civil uh, like. Like they look civilized protesting because they are Westerners. This is the, this is how they do it back in New York or back in wherever they came from. <laughs> like you said, they're not from here. They're not organic. They are people living a show. They are not organic. Nobody's, nobody's ancestry is from here. Nobody's grandma lives here or lived here. Nobody was, nobody was actually uh, made uh, here. Unless like there's a new generation, which we can discuss or welcome, they can stay, but they cannot stay in other people's lands and homes. They cannot be settl settlements and, and raiding people's uh, houses. Do you see? Did you see these people who attacked Alice Qasiyah in Beit Lahan? Did you see these settlers that are coming to take her grand, 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 grandfather's land from her? People who came from Australia or Brazil or like settlers are coming and atta teenagers attacking people and attacking old people living in their farms and in their lands in Beit Lahan, in Christian Beit Lahan. This is what's happening. So you're talking about uh, there's no cohesion. 
they are not a society. They are a bunch of settlers. We call them settlers. Why do we call them settlers? Because they come and they squat in other people's lands and homes. They are not a society. Mm -hmm. What kind of society is built on built on blood and hate and rape and uh, and dehumanization? Right. Even the, the every many of the Jews who came on the birthright trip from America saw that apartheid state and spoke up. And we see them in the streets of New York and Manhattan. In, in Washington, D.C., we see Code Pink. We see we see people who have spoken about what they've uh, witnessed when they came to occupied Palestine or when they came when the Israeli um, occupation uh, invited them to show them that because they chose to have uh, Judaism as their religion, they are entitled to take my land. I mean, what if they change their mind? I can take back my home. I've never asked that question. Some people in India became Jews recently. Okay, recently, like 10 years ago. So they have a birthright to take my land. What if they change their mind after 20 years and they stop being Jews? Can I take back my land? <laughs> I never understood because there are some, you know, there are some who just made like, uh, they just decided to become Jews. So they were brought here. Right. You know, they have no relation to the country whatsoever at all. So, and they take people's lands. So I was wondering maybe like if that's that's the point. It's just a big lie, man. It's not about religion even. Jews are saying not in my name all around the world. It's about Zionism, colonialism, apartheid. It's about confiscating people's lands. And it's all about um, about to end. It needs maybe a decade or two and it's going to be done. Right. Nothing like that can prevail. It never prevailed. Yes, I, I completely agree. This is the, the religion is a pretext for just naked land theft and uh, brutal oppression of a, an indigenous people. It, it has always just been a pretext and it has the religion ultimately has nothing to do with this. Um, I want to talk to you about a country uh, which we haven't had an opportunity to discuss in any detail in our interviews thus far, and that is Syria. Um, and uh, I'll frame my question by just reminding everyone that on July 31st, uh, the, uh, the genocidal regime did not only kill Fuad Shukur in Beirut. It also assassinated Ismail Hania in Iran. And uh, Iran uh, vowed a severe retaliation. So that was about seven weeks ago. And then on Sunday night, Israel attacked reportedly numerous sites in Syria. And according to the Syrian health ministry, the number of people killed there has risen to 18. Uh, that was the last report I saw with dozens more wounded. And this is apparently the largest death toll caused by an Israeli attack on Syria since the beginning of the uh, the genocide in Gaza. And Western media reported, uh, typically, uh, whether this is true or not, who knows, that the attacks were focused on sites that are somehow associated with Iran's military. Iran's government uh, strongly condemned the attacks. But thus far, Ghadi, uh, and I have two questions about this for you. We have not seen anything that looks like, you know, the retaliatory strike that we were expecting from Iran. Um, and do you have any sense of why that's the case? Speaking to people there in Lebanon. Because you don't know Iran. Please, please elaborate. I, I, I'm happy to be educated. <laughs> <laughs> no, not you. I mean, people, they don't yeah. know Iran. They think Iran is America, maybe. And it's going to be, yes, attacking Al-Qaeda with like a, a CCTV telling you where they had been Laden after they made him. <laughs> the Iranians do not do that, <laughs> you know? The Iranians do not. The Iranians do not have Hollywood in the back of their brain. The Iranians don't care about the show. They have like, do you see them like in their media or? Like, they don't care. They they care about what's happening on the ground. I want to ask you one question: How is Israel and uh, how was it on twenty first of July and how is it internally today? It's much worse off. <laughs> That's what I would say. So, I think this is how they retaliate. <laughs> And, In a and, way. and one could also characterize the, Hezbollah. There are many shapes. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. One, there are many shapes. Right. They don't care about the ego. I said that previously with George Galloway, and I'd like to say it again because I want to make it a bite. We have a, an empty war criminal with a big ego called Benjamin Netanyahu. He's struggling to find his way out of a failed attempt to eradicate Hamas, of a failed attempt to free the hostages, of a failed attempt to become loved by the Israelis. 
And on the other side, you have an Islamic Republic of Iran who is willing to reopen uh, uh, nuclear talks with the United States of America, who is making and testing and selling and extravaganza uh, showcasing their weaponry, mm -hmm. their arm manufacturing, and their capability from the Red Sea to disrupt the world trade from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. Sometimes the lion does not race the dog. Understood. So then that, the question, <laughs> well said, well said. Uh, that brings me to my second question uh, about this. <sighs> that is Syria. Um, and your answer, I suspect, is going to be similar to the one you've uh, no. why Syria doesn't re why Syria doesn't right. reply is it because at, at least on the surface you know uh, there may be a lot going on behind the scenes that we don't see but Syria seems to have shown an extraordinary degree of restraint uh, during the yes. last seven months given the number Syria, of times Syria is present in a different way in this uh, war Syria is a nation that has been under an attack since forever in a way it has never been accepted because it never bowed down uh, to the rhetoric of how the middle eastern uh, uh, statico would be the, the syrians ever since forever they never like they were never pro america okay not uh, not on hafiz assad time not on bashar al assad time this is to start with so syria was never uh, in the sense uh, loved or uh, it was always an outcast in a way okay up and down the relations. It's, it's always struggled to keep its sovereignty and its own way of shaping itself in the regional politics, whether it's in the 90s, in the 70s. And in the past decade, it is undergoing a civil war, a very big civil war that started as, a, as something and became something else. And this war wasn't to uh, change the politics and uh, in, 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 to give freedom to the Syrian people. They don't care. They, they don't care about autocracies in, in Saudi Arabia. They don't care uh, what happened to Khashoggi. They don't care that the women can't drive. They don't care. What they care about is that Syria is hostile to Israel. What they care about is that Syria's presence is the only way that Iran can be in the Mediterranean. Because there is a nation called Syria, Iran is present in the Mediterranean. Because there is a nation called Syria and the shape that is Syria, there are weapons in Gaza. Because there is Syria and the governance that is Syria, there is deterrence in Golan Heights. Because Syria is the way Syria is, there is Hezbollah and Hezbollah weaponry. Syria is not, it's not about ego for Syria, but it's not the same answer as Iran. In Syria, it's typically organic. It's, it's, it's what Syria is. It's why Syria is the way it is. It's why Syria is struggling the struggle that it is struggling. It's exactly why they have a problem with Syria. They don't have a problem with Bashar al-Assad or with al-Ba'ath party. I kid you not. They do not care if he killed all his people. It's not about him or whatever chemical weapons. Who buys that? White helmets? What credibility do they have? Did you see what the Qataris said about that? Did you see what the Saudis said about that? Did you see what the Israelis said about that? How it started, how it ended in Syria? Their problem with Syria is the presence of Syria and this resistance axis. And Syria's presence in this resistance axis is not always about retaliating. It's only by breathing and being the backyard of Iraq, of Lebanon, of... Uh, it's the only way that Iran is present and deterring and capable in the Mediterranean waters. And this is not something simple. Mm -hmm. Understood. You know, if, the, if Syria was not the way it is, if Syria was like Jordan, maybe Hezbollah would be like Hamas. Maybe we would uh, not have the capability to get all these big uh, things that are happening, <laughs> you know? Very Syria simple. and ge geopolitically could be, I guess, characterized as the glue that holds the resistance together. You mentioned all these disparate uh, resistance groups spread throughout the region. And, and actually, you know, Syria is the greater nation. It's the actual uh, geography that is still cut. It's the biggest portion after the colonial powers cut out Jordan, Iraq, Lebanon, Palestine. It's the biggest resting portion. So it's big enough to be able to have a, a large land, large army, large roads, large agriculture. Up until the civil war started, it was making its own wheat, feeding its own self. It didn't need anybody. 
it had prospering uh, businesses from north to so it had an, its own shape but uh, this is why also Syria, it's not only the glue, it's the actual mother nation of the Palestinian struggle. It's not Iran. Iran is Persia. Iran might be an ally today. Iran is not the father of the struggle. Yemen is not the father of the struggle. The direct, biological, ancestral mother of the Palestinian struggle is the greater Syria. It's the Levant. It's us. It's our thing. It's with all due respect to the martyrdom or to the sacrifices that the Iranians put. It's not their land. It's mine. Mm -hmm. You know? Lastly, since we're on the subject of uh, countries in the region who are being affected by this war in various ways, there was a quite stunning attack at the Allenby Bridge. Uh, I actually crossed into uh, the occupied West Bank from Jordan uh over the Allenby Bridge in March of this year. Uh, and having read this report, it was surprising to me. It must have required, because of the level of security at the Allenby Bridge, it's otherworldly levels of security. But somehow a truck driver managed to kill three Israelis, a Jordanian, uh, several days ago. The Western media have mostly described the Israeli victims as uh, civilians. But when you read the fine print, you find out that they are security guards. And one of them was also a settler from the West Bank. So exactly what they mean by security guards is unclear. In any event, uh, this was um, a rather unusual so event. So the people, the people at the border in, uh, in army clothes are civilians if they're Israelis. But the babies in the incubators are Hamas if they're Palestinians. Isn't that obvious, Gadi? I mean, I thought we all understood this <laughs> so, i have to say it again and again just like to say it out loud yes it's uh the yeah. the, the, the the derangement How credible they are yeah the, the level of derangement is mind-boggling but in any event uh do you think that's why we're not mentally stable when we're talking about this i'm angry all the time i want to like how can how can we keep on accepting it it's not acceptable you know you have to you have to, every time I'm, on, I'm i'm talking to anyone who works in media i'm like too angry. How are we like normalizing what's happening around us? They're deranged. They depravity, you know. And uh, putting aside the extraordinary, and it is outright derangement, no doubt about it. This Zionist ideology uh, and the various narratives it has spewed out uh, over the years. But um, I'm wondering if you think, and I've realized, you know, it's 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 hard to make predictions uh, in such a volatile situation. But do you think that the Jordanian people are perhaps reaching the limit of their tolerance for this monstrosity on the other side of the Jordan River? Do you think that this is just, what's your sense? I mean, based upon your conversations with people in the region, do you think that the monarchy, this British installed monarchy is going to be able to keep a lid on the popular outrage for much longer? Uh, that strikes me as a very dicey proposition. I, I can't imagine that that this can go on forever. At some point, there's going to be an explosion of anger I would think in Jordan that the monarchy will be unable to suppress. What are, what are your thoughts about this? Jordan is very well secured and very, very uh, dictatorly uh, governed. Uh, everything is monitored. Everything is, the intelligence is very encrypted in everything. But regardless, you cannot, even in Jordan, you cannot change the course of history. Did you see that family, the, the man, that his family, his father was, a, or like his ancestry, is uh, is also his father was speaking they're speaking like all our family used to fight the oppression used to fight the colonial powers used to fight the occupation his grandfather his great grandfather etc it just says a lot about you know that uh, that way that i was telling you how this land will always be these people regardless of the security regardless of the difficulties there will always be the lone wolf kind of operation and I think the lone wolf kind of operations is not always, maybe in Jordan, it is really it erupted out of like spontaneous uh, sp spontaneity, but inside Palestine and in Lebanon and the history, it was not always like that. They, there used to be groups that actually uh, prepare, uh, prepare lone wolves in different places. And that would be a card that is played on the internal uh, stability or, or uh, security or to actually further... Uh, destabilize the enemy. So 
Um, I think this is only the start, whether it's in Jordan or elsewhere. I think in the past, from July 21st till date, but especially in the past three weeks, we have been witnessing a lot of lone wolves. Do you, for the, the, do you remember the, the hammer? There was a Palestinian who actually killed an Israeli soldier with a hammer mm -hmm. inside occupied Palestine. I'm not talking about West Bank. Inside the occupied land. Mm -hmm. There are sentiments of anger. There are sentiments of PTSD. There are sentiments of revenge. The, the dehumanization would only make people lose it. And this, uh, sometimes in the ideology, they say this is the good crazy. People tell, them, tell themselves it is craziness for a good cause. And they go and they do that. You cannot stop it. You cannot tell people that it's okay to kill 60 families. They're buried under the sand at night in their sleep for no reason. Mm -hmm. You want everybody to keep like silent. You cannot, you know, the Buddhism, they tell you if you pick a flower, you're altering a, a kind of energy. You know, you just have to be... Some, some ideologies tell you if you kill a fly, you are messing with the energy. Do you think you can massacre bluntly and you can carry on a televised genocide out uh, in front of the whole people and have no zero reaction and zo zero casualties and zero uh, uh, changes in the course of the energy of this place, I think every drop of blood will liberate. Every drop of blood will further escalate the anger in the chests of the youth. And the youth are always driven with the, this rebellion. You know, you could see them. You, they cannot take it. I cannot take it. I, I, I think you, you're never born here. You cannot take it. People with any kind of conscience, any kind of humanity cannot take this anymore. It's, it's so in, it's just a matter of time, you know. And, and one thing I have to say, just to add on my own thought about this, uh, Gadi, is that the Israelis, I, I, quite apart from the sheer depravity of their genocidal utterances, from the point of view of accomplishing their objectives, these statements that are coming out of their mouths are completely stupid because they're telegraphing to the Palestinian people that their ultimate objective is to wipe them all out. And so all the people in the West Bank, all the people in East Jerusalem, even the Palestinians living in- They have Florida, nothing to lose anymore. Absolutely, absolutely. It, they're, they're being told effectively by the Israeli- You're dead anyways. You're dead. If you don't resist, you're dead. So at that stage, you may as well resist because you know you're dead. No, if you're and if you're, if you're in, in prison, you will be raped. And the dog would eat your face and the dog would rape you. Yeah. Of course yeah. people it's... will fight. Wouldn't you? I always ask, uh, like, you know, sometimes people tell me, don't speak like this. You're jeopardizing your status. You cannot speak. As it. Okay, I will just ask people, what would do you do if it's in your family, in your country, in your people? Do you tell me it's okay? It's not okay. We will not shut up. We will not be silenced. It's not okay. It will never be okay. We will not get past that. You will have to readjust. Whatever, whoever you are, whether it's a TV, it's a media station, it's a business deal, whatever, you will have to readjust. It's not okay. We will never, we just, you know, our foot is on the ground. We have paid so much for that land and we're not packing out. There's mm -hmm. no way. We're dead. Until we liberate our land, we are all dead. And let's conclude on this point for all of those, uh, in case anybody from some Western intelligence agency happens to be listening to this conversation. The fact of the matter is that every single human being has an inalienable right to resist genocide. And if you don't like that, too bad. We will say it, and we will say it over and over again. And well, the international law says it, and Geneva Convention correct. says it, Absolutely. and, uh, and, and God, basic, and Jesus say basic, it. Basic human decency says it. It is indecent to say that people have to submit passively to their own destruction. It is monstrous to say such a thing. In any event, I had to get that off my chest. I'm I'm very happy to have spoken <laughs> with you again this evening, Gadi. I has saw no evidence. You made me feel way that, better. Uh, well, I, I saw no evidence whatsoever that you're tired or <laughs> that you're stressed. I saw, uh, you know, your typical impassioned and eloquent self, and I really appreciate you speaking with me again. Tonight. Because it always makes us feel better to speak out, to think at least we're not silenced about it. And because of speaking to you, I know I'm speaking to all your viewers from the other side of the world. It's more like a calling for me. I should do that because I cannot. This is the way that I fight the injustice, you know. I feel more 
uh, uh, like active, less uh, guilty towards everything that I'm seeing. I just call on everyone around, please, anybody who's watching this, do not make it normal. It's not normal that we wake up and we see that 60 families were buried in the sand. Please do not normalize this flood. Speak about it every day on every platform to everyone that you can. Thank you. Amen. And this is uh, Dimitri Lascaris signing off with Gadi Francis on September 10th, 2024.